Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yeah, we are hearing you well. Okay. You're starting your recording already? <laughs> yeah. Dang it. Uh, I've just noticed I'm on the wrong Wi Fi. So let me just change to the correct one here. Okay, no problem. Okay, I guess I'm back. Can I just test my share? Oh, you already put that up. Uh, I just want to just test if I can share my screen here. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hey. We we'll even get music. <laughs> Just before the, the beginning. <laughs> Dr. Alwini, can I just um, confirm the pronunciation of your last name? Is it Alwini? That that sounds good to me. Are you sure? Do you say it? How do you pronounce it? I probably pronounce it the same way as you. I've spent too much time in North America. <laughs> Um, Leandria, I have changed some slides on my presentation. Should I share my screen or I just send you? Uh, you will share your screen. No problem. Okay, no problem. Yeah.
Welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Thanks for being with us here today. My name is Corey Ann Rice. We're going to be kicking off shortly. Um, Heen, how about I kick it over to you to give us a brief introduction of Heen? Hello, everyone. So uh, welcome to this event uh, prepared by IEN. So I'm Hindra Sok, I'm an architect and urban planner, and I'm the security executive of IEN uh, and a representative of uh, North Africa. So for a start, I would like to introduce you to African Innovation Network so, you, that, so that you can know more about us. Yandri, can you share uh, please with me uh, the animation so I can share my uh, my link? It's okay now. Okay, perfect. So we're African Innovation Network. It's a new initiative that started last year. So uh, African Innovation Networks brings together experts in diverse and varied fields to offer sustainable and innovative solutions to complex problems linked to the African continent. We have members from all around Africa. So, uh, and our uh, and the founder of this initiative is Landry Jetsu. 
So as you can see, here are the members, the actual members of the African Innovation Network. The target themes of the African Innovation Network covered all fields enabling sustainable and resilient sustainable development through Africa. So these themes are grouped around ma three main axes, inclusive cities, innovation and technology, and finally, environment and climate actions. You might heard of us uh, through our social media because we have we publish every single day new articles. So we have our main activity is uh, this, this uh, publication through our uh, social media platforms. We're active on Facebook, LinkedIn, and on Instagram, as well as YouTube. So we have different initiatives as the City Pixels and Colors. This, is in, this initiative is more to show the beauty of, uh, and uh, the beauty of our African cities. Urban planning innovation is to show the new techniques, new innovations in the conceptions of our, of our cities and architecture. African urban heritage is to show our well-known house and our, our heritage in Africa so that we can learn from. And because today's identity and tomorrow's innovations are based on, our, on the genius of the past. And finally, we have African urban imaginary that aims to capture and promote urban planning, complexity and originality in, through, in Africa through satellite images of urban tissues. Our second main activity is the African Round Tour. It's a documentary series that gives voices to the continent's actors to draw uh, and to draw visions and inclu for inclusive African cities, especially through potentials of innovations and technology development. So this year we were able to have our first destination that was in Cameroon, and to, through this uh, documentary we were able to meet actors uh, from different fields, urban planners, architects, and even people who are involved in policy. So this third documentary, it was to address the challenges of urbanizations in Cameroon through the eyes of these experts and to draw the fundamentals for building more resilient and sustainable urban settlement in Cameroon. Our second May, our third main activity is the African Cities magazine that we normally publish everything if every 31st, uh, 31st October uh, on the day of the world of the day of uh, the world cities day so last year we published the first edition of this annual magazine with a series of innovations initiatives and projects on urban planning architectures or design this first edition so showcases how innovative ideas and solutions uh, shape urban system into more resilient inclusive and sustainable human settlements in africa and that is through different portraits and interviews of, uh, of innovators and, cha and change makers in architecture and urban, and urban development in Africa. And we also hope to showcase the beauty, diversity, challenges, and opportunities in African cities of today, as well as paint up pictures of what the cities of tomorrow will look like. And we're excited to announce to you, to you all today that we will have our second edition uh, launching next week on the third, uh, on the 31st October of this month. So I would like uh, to invite you all to um, keep updated through uh, our social media networks. And if you are following us on uh, our social media platforms, you would see that we share different uh, interviews during these last months. And they are they are part of this magazine, and th that's why we would we would like to invite you all to uh, follow us on all to follow us on all our social medias. We are uh, present, as I said before, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, on Twitter, and even on uh, YouTube, where we, you can be able to see our documentary and the interviews that we were able to help for our for our uh, second edition magazine. So for that, I, it was just a briefing for our initiative and our activities so that you know more about us. And of course, we invite you again to follow us to, uh, to, to keep updated and to know more. So now I will leave it for Corey to present our speakers for today. And I hope that you will enjoy with this webinar. 
Thank you so much for that, Hind, and welcome everyone. It is so wonderful to be here with you today. My name is Corianne Rice, and I will be the moderator for the next portion of our Future of African Cities webinar, um, which will be a panel and question and answer session in which we'll be, we will be exploring three main topics. The first, what should an educational model look like for future generation of architects and urban planners in Africa? The second is how can culture influence urbanization on the continent? And the third is what is the role of innovation in the future of African cities? For this discussion, I am honored to be joined by four incredible practitioners, Dr. Mark Olwani, Dr. Miriam Mayina, Mr. Sebastian Gothels, and Ms. Imadili Okumangwa. What I would like to do next is to just give everyone a sense of how today's session will be structured. I will briefly introduce myself and then I will introduce our panelists who will each speak for about 15 minutes. So we're gonna spend about an hour going through prepared remarks today. And then we will open it up to questions. We'll be monitoring your questions and comments as we go along. So please feel free to add those into the Q&A section um, on the bottom of this Zoom chat. And we will present those to the speakers after they have all had wrapped up their remarks um, and we'll present those during the question, question and answer portion. So with that, I will start with a brief bio of myself. I have a background in financial services where I worked in marketing and sales training for roughly 15 years. After I then received my master's in sustainable cities, I joined a nonprofit where I work with local governments in the US on implementing inclusive entrepreneur led economic growth interventions. In addition, I manage a fellowship in venture capital where we look to identify early stage startups that reduce the cost, increase the speed and increase the quality of affordable housing solutions. And I've been a proud member of the Africa Innovation Network since June 2020, where I focus on innovation, city innovation and sustainability. So I'm very excited to be part of this discussion today and to foster interaction, not only amongst our speakers, but also between you all, our um, participants and the speakers, so we can have an interactive dialogue about the future of African cities. So I am going to introduce the speakers one by one. So you will see me popping in, in between presentations until we get to the Q&A section. So for our first topic, educational models for future architects and urban planners, I am pleased to introduce our first panelist, Dr. Mark Olwani. Dr. Olwani is a researcher, architect, and senior lecturer um, in the University of Lincoln School of Architecture in the built environment in the UK and at Uganda Martyrs University. Dr. Olwani has experience in environmental design, urban design, sustainable architecture, and architectural education in developing countries, and he has a PhD in architecture from Cardiff University. Dr. Olwani, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much, Corian. Um, I would like to have the ability to share the screen if possible. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm looking forward to the discussions that are going to follow. I still cannot share my screen. I'll give me one second, Dr. Alwani, we are working on that, apologies. You can, you're, I, no, you can do it now, I think. I am good now, okay, thank yes. you so much. Perfect. Uh, okay. That, that was an easy bit. The other bit is actually finding out what you're supposed to present. Where is it? Uh, keynote. Yep, that's... Okay, can you see that title slide? Yeah, yes. Fantastic. Um, I titled this presentation, Thoughts on the Education of Future Architects and Planners. And, and I, I Although I could clarify this or quantify it by saying sub-Saharan Africa, it could probably apply to any place around the world because there's similar issues that affect architecture and uh, urbanism in different parts of the world. As has been presented, I am an architect and urban planner. And it was something I did deliberately because at a very early part of my career, I thought it was important to actually take on both of those because I could see this as building up into something quite important into, into the future. So my trajectory through university itself has led me to some of the decisions that I've come um, to in my own career and some of the highlights of the thoughts on what architecture 
education and planning education could be into the future. So as we see, although this presentation, as I said, is concentrated on Africa, we can apply a lot of these broadly because some of the similar issues come out. At a global level, we generally talk about architecture and urbanism of Africa, but it generally relates to the mega cities as we see on this map here from the, uh, the diaspora group. Um, this is quite an old one, so it's obviously been updated since. But some of the, the challenges with presenting in this way, it makes the assumption or the presumption that the mega cities are where actually the problems are. And, and you look at this map and they highlight the key ones. Of course, you've got the mega cities in Nigeria, north in Cairo, and then you've got a few propping up in the south and the east. Uh, what we're not told is the rate of urbanization that actually exists on the ground. So you've got Gabon, which is 90% urbanized. At the other end of the scale, you've got Niger, which is 17%. So the information that we're given on the map like this sort of removes a key part of that discussion, which has to do with population movements, secondary cities in particular, which are cities between 500,000 and a million and the growth that is happening there and the challenges that exist in those particular cases. Now, to put this in perspective, we look at the, um, a few architects and planning registration boards around the world. Now, the data I got here is mainly for architects. So you've got Kenya where we have a considerable number of architects, but when you look at the registration statistics, 92% of registered firms actually are based in Nairobi. Uh, that doesn't leave many in the other cities. Very similar situation exists in Uganda. What does that mean? That really means that um, those architects, although they're probably working in all these different centers, are bringing with them similar ideas from the mega cities and taking them to smaller cities, which means that they're exacerbating problems that will probably existed in the main centers and taking them to the smaller centers rather than working the other way around. So what probably is happening there is that the problem of urbanization, urban centers and population growth probably is going to get uh, larger because we're not actually addressing the key problems that exist on the ground. And this feeds back into education itself, where the education that people are receiving likely is related directly to the large urban areas. And this has to do with the historical development of education, which I'll talk about slightly later. But let's have a look on um, some of the other area things that come to mind. Let's look at definitions of urbanization and how this also contributes to some of the challenges that we face. So we look at the definition that's used by South Africa, where urbanization is defined as a place where there is some form of local authority and it includes both formal and informal urban centers. Now, because of that definition, we have what is defined as urban as being about 67%, with a growth rate of about 2%. We have a look at Ghana. Ghana defines urbanization as a town or community with a population of 5,000. Um, so we now have a population of, of the urban as 57%. But now we have these two. We have Kenya, where their definition is any center with a population of 10,000 and it needs to be gazetted. Now, because of that, we end up with a massive drop in urbanization that is now down to 28%. And when you look at Uganda, which basically says urbanization is something that is gazetted by government, it's down at 24%. Now, this considerably skews the reality that is on the ground, because the underground we know, if we take 5,000 or we take a local authority, the picture on the ground considerably changes, which means that how we present this information in education is not giving us a true picture of what is on the ground, which means that we are unable to address these issues in any way or form. Now, historically, and, and these are, sorry, these are some of the images that are picked up in the context of Kampala that shows some of the conditions that are exacerbated by this. But when we look broadly around at the history of education itself, 
we see another challenge. And these are some um, statistics that came out of a survey of planning and architecture by the Commonwealth Association of Planners and the Commonwealth Association of Architects, which shows the, the range of um, the, the range that we have here. So we got populations per member of the National Planning Association. So you got Bangladesh, which is quite high, uh, and the UK, which is down the bottom there, which shows the, the relationship between planners and population. When we have uh, the number of planning schools, you see Nigeria has a substantial number, and then you'll go the way down to, to Malta and Trinidad, which are much lower. But of course, the populations for those are, are mark markedly different. So the, the planning schools they have versus population can cope with a situation like that. Problem comes when you start looking at architecture. And this is now an inverse map. So on one side, you have the number of registered architects per thousand people. And the other side, you have the rate of urbanization. And there's an inverse relationship here, which starts speaking about some of the challenges that we have on the ground here. When you look at the number of uh, the ratio of architects, you can see Malta now is excelling in that area. And then you see Uganda completely um, at a loss at the bottom with 0 0.004 architects per thousand people, which suggests that there's a lot of stuff going on in Uganda, Ghana, Bangladesh, that is not directly done by any registered professional. When you come to number of schools, it's a very similar scenario as well, where you've got the smaller countries having um, probably one school, but because of the population, that number is quite high versus countries with large populations, not enough architects there. So now when you put these together, architects and planning, uh, planning groups, uh, there is obviously plenty of work available for the professionals, but because they're concentrated in a small area, their ability to make a difference diminishes greatly as a result of being in the primate cities. So related to that, part of my research has been thinking, how can we optimize this? How can we actually make this work for everybody and make this, uh, this process linking professionals to what activities on the ground, how could we make it um, a, a less of us and them? And this book, Radical Pedagogies, is a good one. And it starts off with a, a key point in there where the editors of this book suggest that the book itself is designed for obsolescence. And I took this as an important part of our ability to address some of the challenges that we face on the ground in architecture and planning. In that, a number of things that we teach, a number of the things we profess are probably not, um, they're probably obsolete and no longer relevant for some of the things that we teach that are happening on the ground today. And this has to do with, again, the historic development of the profession. And we'll, we will come to that shortly. It also relates to the issue of values and ethics. What do we teach? What is the goal of our educational process? And what changes do we want to see as a result of that? A number of times when we come across ethics, it tends to be restricted to when you graduate rather than what we teach, how we teach it, what we want our students to take on board. And this becomes a problem when you see the key issues that relate to um, architecture and planning where you would like students when they graduate to take on board some of the challenges that are on the ground, but because of what they're taught, how they're taught it and where they've taught it, that is not embedded in the system. And therefore, the chance of them engaging with those activities is greatly diminished. Another thing that affects this is also the models of education that we use. And here are a range of them. And in my research, while there are opportunities for things like electives, what I've found for the most part is most schools of planning and architecture have a very strong core curriculum and virtually no electives, which means the one thing that is of utmost importance in these curricula, the ability to speak to other people, the ability to listen to other people doesn't exist which means that the professions themselves become the problem 
because they do not take into account the reality that once you leave the university setting, you will actually be interfacing with a number of different people. It goes on even into the format of these professions. And, and this is a version of, of the previous one. Uh, so I'm not really going to go into that one. But we start thinking, how are we going to engage with the future? And this image on the left of the screen there, I, I found in relation to the post-colonial period or the uh, independence movement. And it actually comes from Russia or the Soviet Union, as it was called then. And it was designed as a way of promoting Eastern uh, European or the Soviet bloc interventions in Africa. And what it actually says there in Russian, or uh, I'm probably paraphrasing, not quoting here, uh, it's about the Africans mastering their own domain. It's about ending bondage. And at the bottom there, it states down with the colonialists, i.e. referring to Western Europe. Now, looking at architecture, we have to now see how can we decolonize architecture and planning education such that the education itself becomes a key driver for change rather than hoping that change happens after people leave the schools. So we have to think what education itself is. And, and education is one of those processes that we probably don't think too much about, but it is quite powerful in creating scenarios that are very difficult to change. And, and Gross in 1901 made that statement that humanity itself is now becoming more organized around what we teach, uh, essentially a manufactured reality rather than one that is uh, geared towards addressing constantly changing realities. And then of course, the reality that formal education, particularly in planning and architecture, is not part of the African educational approach. It was essentially brought in from Europe, and therefore, as Foster noted, it was Africans being educated like Europeans. And if you do look at the early uh, curricula, that was very, very overt and very obvious. And then lastly, of course, from the point of view of someone who went through that system, the fact that their own experiences were ignored. And once you ignore some of the experiences, essentially you, you, you marginalize them, the ability to respond to them going forward is greatly reduced. So on the other side, we have these two that we have to be addressing more succinctly. In the end, education most essentially its most essential mission is to develop within each student the capacity to build competences but also to be wise in the choices they make and lastly by Porter uh, the idea that we're spending a lot of money uh, embedding values in students and the values we embed in education are an important part of that discussion so what are some of these values the key one of course is collaboration the fact that students need to speak to other professions, they need to engage with students from different parts of the world, different parts of Africa, so that they come to understand that their opinion is one of many, and the more you listen to, the better able you are to make decisions going forward. The fact that as educators ourselves, we probably need to introduce some alternative pedagogies to help us reach a much broader population. The standard approach that exists, particularly in architecture education, and this is a debate we're having even here in the UK, where you put students in a studio, that studio is yours, doesn't really play out very well anymore, particularly after COVID, which has been demonstrated that that actually can be dispensed with to a degree. Uh, and so other ways of doing it have to come into play. And of course, a major one is this idea of travel, um, not only internationally, but within your country or region, talking to people to find out what they actually think. Um, one of the biggest challenges in architectural and planning education is the eventual belief that what we do uh, is because we are the experts. And yet the reality is we are just conduits for people's ideas. Um, uh, and, and that has to be something that we take on board. Now, coming back to um, quickly finish this off, the original curricula of architecture or built environment education, as you can see on the left in terms of the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, 
embedded some of these ideas in there. You started off with a general degree and then you branched off to these different components. My own interpretation uh, is on the right of this screen, which I produced about 10 years ago. I probably should update this because a lot of ideas have come out of this. Is showing the interrelationship between different elements of the curriculum. So we've got interior architecture, we've got architecture, we've got technology, landscape architecture, and engineering can all share some communality, particularly in the early phases. And that starts embedding within these programs a key element that is currently missing because a lot of these courses are done in silos and in some cases, not even in the same school. So you've got planning and architecture, supposedly working the same thing, but sitting on different parts of a university, which is a recipe for problems in the future. And then the last one, this is my last slide, is having the strength and being brave enough to transform things so that students are better able to address the challenges they will face. And that is key. The challenges the students today will be facing tomorrow will likely be quite different from what the challenges are today. And as we're doing that, reformatting the curriculum, being brave enough to change things around, being brave enough to shuffle things around so that they start addressing some of these conditions that exist in the future. And key to that, is also being brave enough to eliminate fat, eliminate some aspects of the curricula which are not relevant to the conditions that we are in. And to finish off, I'll just leave you with that as a question. Are we able to engage with architecture and planning education for a sustainable future in Africa by looking at what we have now and planning for it to work for the future. Thank you very much, Corinne. I'll pass it back to you. Thank you so much for that presentation, Dr. Alwini. Really insightful. Um, for those in the audience, I do want to remind all of you to put any questions that you have for our speakers in the Q&A as we go along, and we will be collecting them and then posing them to our panelists at the end um, in our allotted question and answer portion. For now, I would like to introduce our second panelist, Dr. Miriam Maina, to talk about sustainable development in African towns and cities. Dr. Maina is an urban researcher, GIS, and data analytics consultant. She holds a master's and a doctorate in town and regional planning from the University of the Witwatersrand in South Africa and a BA in urban and regional planning from the University of Nairobi in Kenya. In her work, Dr. Mayina uses social and geospatial data, analytics, illustration, and storytelling to analyze the social and economic development of African towns and cities. Dr. Mayina, greatly appreciate you being with here, uh, here with us today, and I will turn it over to you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, let me confirm that my sound is okay. Can you hear me? You sound wonderful. Okay. Give me a minute to, to start my slide. So just give me a second. <laughs> Um, but it's such an honor to be here and, it, and actually to present just after uh, Dr. Olwene because some of, the, some of the thoughts and stuff that I wanted to share with us today are already covered. So I feel very confident to just move on to, to the next slide. Um, but as you heard, my, my, my name is Miriam and I'm a town planner by profession. And a, research, a, a postdoctoral researcher at the NRF Chair in Spatial Analysis and City Planning in the School of Architecture and Planning at WITS. But I'm originally from Nairobi, Kenya. And so it's, um, it's, it's a great honor to be here and to listen to some of the concerns across the continent that we are all experiencing. Um, so my presentation today will pick up actually from where Dr. Olweni has, um, has presented. And I will try to zoom out a bit more to um, some of these issues that you already know relating to Africa's urbanization that is being projected to drive most of the world's urbanization. And then to pick up some of the opportunities we may have around coordinating action at the local government level. Uh, so um, the rapid technological change that is happening today has really affected all sectors and will continue to transform how we live in and operate and manage cities. 
and how city governments can engage with and collaborate with all residents and stakeholders. So my presentation will be calling for a more innovative look at how we understand and use data and information to inform decision making, to deepen partnerships and collaboration, and to create more effective and equitable towns and cities. So as we have heard, and as we can see from the data and statistics, Africa's future is urban. Data and statistics tell us that the African um, subcontinent, this African continent in general in the region will drive most of the world's urbanization in the next few decades. And this is important, I think, for a few reasons. Number one, the pace itself is unprecedented. So not only is Africa's population going to increase, but the number of agglomerations will go up. And this, the, the growth itself is being driven by small and medium-sized cities. And as you heard from the previous presentation, these are some of the towns which no, normally do not have either the capacity or the resources to, to coordinate um, equitable or sustainable growth. At the same time, as we saw from the previous maps, it will also take the form of urban agglomerations in regions which require really coordinated um, action, not just across different counties or different towns within the same country, but in some of the bigger sub-regions, it actually requires coordination across different countries. So a regional level of coordination and planning and actually investment. And last but not least, um, the bulk of the investment and development is actually done by residents and individuals in what experts are referring to as popular urbanism, sometimes undertaken with the support of built environment professionals, sometimes not. Um, and it's done plot by plot incrementally and over time. So households are the ones that are driving most of the development of cities. And we really need to consider that. Um, so these facts need to be obviously contextualized against well-known realities, such as the need to respond to issues of climate change, to steward the production of more sustainable, equitable, and inclusive spaces, and to ensure that we strengthen our ability to, repon to respond to unexpected crises, such as the devastating global pandemic. And traditionally, Africa's urban future is viewed through this lens of catastrophe, and we can all list all the challenges we have at the national, at the regional, and the local government level. And in our social, political, and econ economic realities that continue to stifle our ability to achieve this equitable future. And these are not light concerns. We should really look into them. But today, I would like to highlight a few provocations under this theme of innovation that are pointing towards a more proactive and collaborative approach to responding to the challenges. So the first point I wanted to raise is um, how do we think about informality? The COVID pandemic reminded us of, the inter of how interrelated our cities are and of the fact that our personal, our physical and our psychological health and well-being will be affected by the social, economic and spatial form of the cities we live in. When we were, when we were put under, for example, mandatory lockdown in some of the cities and residents were forced to stay home and implement social distancing and meet certain health and safety regulations, it quickly became apparent that the, most, the poorest residents of most of our cities were once again pushed to higher vulnerabilities without access to adequate space for social distancing, basic services, reliable public transport, food shortages as supply chains were compromised, and reduced incomes and economic vulnerability since most of them or most of us could not work at home. So in considering innovation, then I wanted to start with this well-worn idea, like how do we think about the informal, or the unregulated or the unplanned? Labeling areas as informal or illegal or unregulated does not negate their presence. Instead, these labels create gray areas that remain outside the official consciousness of the state and therefore outside the investment priorities of administrations. And if most of our neighborhoods and towns are being built by residents and households incrementally through organic processes that may or may not fall outside what the state considers to be formal, how can we begin to coordinate a more harmonized approach to development? How are we adjusting our laws and our regulations to make sure that services, infrastructure, and critical amenities are available for all residents? Um, my second provocation is that local government is key. When we talk of city building, our minds naturally drift to town planners and architects and engineers. But today I would like to push past this functional separation of roles and responsibilities and actually argue that the mandate of local government as a whole is to create a, and maintain a special social and economic environment that we're going to live in. And in the judicial, 
it is a duty to work with stakeholders through democratic processes or something to ensure that we are collectively building effective towns and cities. Local governments are the stewards of, the, of what urban future we will experience. They formulate the strategic plans, they articulate the long-term trajectory for development, they propose how we can achieve more sustainable futures. They raise revenue to provide critical services such as electricity, water, sewerage, sanitation, stormwater, refuse removal, firefighting, municipal health. They build roads and facilities for public transport, markets, parks, recreation, and all community facilities. They determine the zoning and development control guidelines and approve what developers and households can and cannot build, where, when, and how. So my second provocation is even more ambitious. If we want to have better, more productive, more inclusive, and more effective cities, then this mandate has to be met at the local government level. And if we want to untangle and address some of these challenges that we're talking about that are making our cities and towns not um, the most ideal spaces, then we need to solve the issues of capacity and resources and coordination and harmonization at the local level. Otherwise, we will continue to reproduce exactly what we say we don't want to have. And my argument is we need to develop then systems of coordination, not just within, for example, the built environment practitioners or private and public sector, but actually um, across local government departments, all the urban actors and decision makers, private sector architects and planners and developers, financiers, individual households, if we're ever going to produce sort of effective urban spaces. And today I want to highlight on the role of data as a strategic asset to sort of um, support this process. Let's quickly pivot to some of these exciting changes that are occurring with data in the fourth industrial revolution. So the 4IR is really broad and exciting and I can't, uh, I'm, I won't be covering a lot of it today, but I would like to highlight the fact that the 4IR is, um, is a broadest ecosystem that pulls together accelerated change and transformation in technology, in production, in computing, and the rise in networks and information and collaboration, but also due to the technological breakthroughs in AI and robotics and the internet of things, automation, biotech and quantum computing. And alongside this, then the rise of big large scale information and big data. So sometimes when we pivot to data, it seems like data is the only reason why we need to be excited about the 4IR, but actually it's not. We need to look at the process of digitization and how digitization is allowing us to work with technology to make better decisions. But let's come back to data for today. Um, data when converted to information and insight is really the driving force between some of these changes we're seeing in the economic, social, political shifts and driving most of the innovation across society. The global coordination and tracking and response to the global pandemic that I just pointed to, for example, provides a useful example of how data and information, but also other, other mechanisms were pulled together across different sectors to inform and shape a global response. So data only becomes valuable once it's processed and converted into information and knowledge and action, and that speaks to capacity. So if we look at um, local government, one of the quick arguments we make is urban data was always there. In their day-to-day -day work, local governments collect a lot of information if you go to the licensing department to get a permit to open a shop, someone captures that activity. The planning department has records of who, where, and how development is happening across the city. Trading, water, public transport, all these departments have data and information that they use to manage their portfolios, to inform their decisions, and actually decide where they want to invest. Traditionally, this data was, um, was in paper form. Um, but with shifts in digitization and some of these uh, developments that we're seeing, this has changed. And in the past and today, however, unfortunately, most of these databases are still collected, maintained, and utilized within these closed departmental systems, which are the backdrop of the silo mode of operation that drives some of the action in private public sector. And while some of the departments use the information for strategic policies, decisions, and investment, most departments actually might not use this information once they're collected. So can we begin to imagine a future where all this information in departmental databases can be pulled into an urban data ecosystem 
that functions as a commonly as accessible asset that can be used by multiple actors to inform policy, strategic planning, and investment. This is a tall order indeed, but I think it's a necessary shift. And my, my suggestion here is if corporations can leverage data, so private sector, for example, to improve customer experiences, to open new markets, to increase efficiency and productivity, and to create new sources of competitive advantage, why can't we aspire to do this at local government levels? And a quick disclaimer here about the issue of data and governance and power. So there are very many concerns when it comes to data, human rights, and the potential for misuse, especially within political frameworks where power relations are not balanced. It would really be naive to adopt a technocratic assumption that data does not carry a potential for bias or have implications on power or politics. Data is political. However, like any other tool, the use or misuse of data is not a flow in the, the data itself, but in what the practitioners are allowed to do or not do with the data. So one of the suggestions I wanted to leave the, uh, put on the discussion today is that using the so data can be used for political purposes, but choosing to not use data is also a political act. And we don't rely on evidence-based decision-making, processes of planning, political and administrative action, then we will still have political decisions and administrative actions, but they will be taken based on other forms of rationalization or sentiment that are not necessarily um, democratic or that cannot be clearly discussed by all the actors. So the push to lean towards more evidence-based approaches is actually to say we can use data to support the political administrative decision processes at the local government level. And a more productive exercise then is to create the rules that relate to data governance and to formulate data protection laws and regulations that can work towards the right-based sharing environment. However, I'm really aware that from the research on the continent, some of Africa's leading economies still lack laws that clearly safeguard the data privacy rights of residents. We have to put these safeguards in place. And the timeline that I wanted to share with us here today is from the city of New York's open data platform, which we really admire in the end goal to see what they've been able to achieve by being able to open up all their municipal data for a big um, community to begin to work with. But what we see today is a robust open data ecosystem that has really enhanced the functioning of the administration itself, but also empowered the community, tech and app developers, mobility companies, taxi, companies, but also real estate and, and, and um, resident sectors. What we don't see is how long this process took to be achieved. As we can see, it, um, the vision itself goes as far back as the 1970s and has been incrementally implemented from department to department, all the way to the Department of IT that was created in 2001. And so when we see today an open data portal for the New York City, we need to understand the back process that has led them there. So my point here is the process is long and is complex and deeply political, but it is not impossible. Um, so to conclude, I will just go through my points again. The first one is that Africa's future is urban. Our towns, cities, and metropolitan regions will be critical in shaping what kind of future we will have on the continent. Local actors, especially municipal administrations, will be critical in determining what kinds of cities and towns we will build and live in. There is an opportunity to leverage the already existing urban data ecosystem to support evidence-driven planning, investment, and collaboration towards a more equitable future. This, however, requires a systemic shift in governance in the technical capacity of actors, not just within the local government, but in actually the private sector that invests in the cities, but also in the households and residents that are operate in the city. We need to shift to a culture of collaboration, cooperation and knowledge exchange, and, and build some of these measures of accountability. And we are however aware of the capacity and resources challenges that exist within local government and administrations, especially within the secondary towns and cities that will be growing very rapidly. Without financial resources, technical, technological and administrative capacity, local governments may continue to struggle to steward the development in a more productive direction. My argument, uh, my point here is if we look to the broader ecosystem of urban players, as, as Dr. Olweni was showing, once you expand the view to 
to not just the local government actors or start looking at other different practitioners that are operating within the same field, what we call built environment or city building, then we find the capacity is there. If you go to the universities and technical colleges and the NGOs and special interest groups or the private sector corporations, there's a lot of technical and technological capacity. So using the data example, if we can invest in a collaborative urban data ecosystem that is well regulated and managed, but also easily accessible, and then if we invest in spaces of innovation and partnership with other actors and institutions, so for example, urban labs, then even an under-resourced local government can really benefit from all the other players' expertise to help it achieve its mandates. And this is not a utopian idea. Many of the revolutionary changes we're seeing in the 4IR could not have been achieved without corporations working with the research and the university communities through innovation hubs, innovation labs, and learning networks. Silicon Valley is the best example of this. Can we borrow this model to solve the seemingly intractable problems of African urbanization? Such approaches would need to be embedded in a political and administrative culture that really embraces um, data and information sharing, collaboration, knowledge exchange, and inclusion, but within a properly governed and regulated ecosystem. But they would open up a more proactive, democratic, and collaborative pathway towards problem solving, innovation, and experimentation, and hopefully drive a more equitable urban future on our continent. Um, as part of this network of change makers, I'm really excited and I'd really love to know and um, connect and learn more about what is happening across the different towns and cities represented here today, especially if there's um, university city collaborations or experimental labs and hubs that are happening across the cities that are here today. It would really be wonderful to learn about that. But thank you very much for your time. Dr. Mayena, thank you so much for that presentation. I found it really useful in clarifying all of the multiple stakeholders um, and the role of data in sustainable urban African development um, and understanding the challenges that come with these system exchanges as well. Thank you. Next, thank you. Next, I'm pleased to introduce Sebastian Gothels, a professional urban development expert, um, urban planner and architect with over 16 years experience in developing cities in Europe and Africa and in Asia Pacific, focusing on green infrastructure planning, transport infrastructure, sustainable urban mobility and logistics. Sebastian founded CityLinks in China and in the, in the Netherlands to build bridges between disciplines and to design solutions for cities facing inadequacy of infrastructure and transport systems, street and public space responsiveness to livability, resilience, and public health. So welcome, Sebastian, and thank you for being here today. Thank you, Corian. Thanks a lot for the introduction. Hello, everyone. It's really a pleasure for me to be invited in your network today to give a presentation. Actually, it's really inspiring to see uh, so many planners from the African continent uh, gathering together and exchanging ideas. I really, really enjoy the initiative. So uh, today I'm just going to uh, give my little contribution uh, to what is uh, possibly um, innovation in the future of African city with a broad view and and actually a few links with uh, what uh, Mark and Miriam just uh, explained. So actually, um, yeah, I will cover a little bit um, some prospective views on urbanization, but also from my experience in, in several cities. So um, we all know that, yeah, we are more than 50% of urban population today, but it's going to reach 65% of urbanization worldwide uh, by the next 30 years. And um, well, uh, globally, we can see by 2030, actually uh, demographic blocks, if I could say like China, India, and Africa will all reach one and a half billion people. Uh, and then actually the African population will rise much further and the Chinese one will, will decrease. But it shows actually um, a kind of pattern of urbanization towards mega cities and uh, also the rise of the urban economy, which is going at, at different speeds. 
and uh, with different models. And it's quite interesting to, um, to learn from each other at this time. So, well, I'm from Belgium, but actually I've spent most of my career in Asian and African cities, uh, mostly in West Africa, but also in China when I, I saw and I practiced there and I saw like six to seven million people um, coming in one city in a few years to live. And uh, so in China, we have like uh, in a period of 35 years, we will have 1 billion people migrating to, from the countryside to cities. And actually Africa is uh, on the way to, to have similar numbers, but completely different patterns. And uh, as Marx was saying, actually, uh, at the beginning of, of this presentation, uh, well, we look a lot of African mega cities, and you can see here on the right that actually we have about 10 uh, very large cities in Africa, which actually totalize 12% of the African urban population. And then, okay, we still have 29 primary cities, uh, metropolitan areas, which have 17% 17% of the African population. But what is really happening behind, and that's the forest behind the trees, is that half of the, this urbanization process is happening in secondary cities. And when we are looking at that, we realize that the lack of governance and the absence of African planners is not really happening in the centralized place. I mean, the, in the capital cities, well, many African countries are still very centralized, but actually something is happening in secondary tertiary cities that really needs more governance, more tools, and of course, more planners, more disciplines, and also less silos when it's about uh, to plan urban development, but also infrastructure services, and of course, the urban economy. So uh, this, is, this is a major uh, aspect that we, we are actually now investing more attention to, but it's quite recent. And uh, while primary cities and mega cities are still uh, struggling to catch up with uh, previous insufficient planning because actually urbanization went too fast, sometimes without um, uh, enough uh, um, uh, attention to, to, to strategic planning, but also operational planning. Well, in the present time, there is also a need to address immediate response to urgencies in many aspects, from affordable housing to slum upgrading, but also uh, infrastructure uh, connectivity and accessibility, and definitely uh, building uh, a, a solid base for the urban economy and providing jobs. Then, well, the environmental pressure and climate risk are on the rise, but that's also part of potentially a circular economy model that can be applied in a decentralized way for, for African cities. So uh, anytime there is a threat uh, or an obstacle, there are multiple opportunities that come from informality, communities, and potentially city, citizen engagement and participatory planning. But those uh, potential areas of improvement and the healthy development of African cities are sometimes hidden or disconnected. So it, it's, it's a lot about connecting the dots to uh, de developing the right model for, for the right city. And, and, and this, is, this is actually uh, very fascinating because now we can, we can really see a young generation of planners that uh, is taking this and, and trying to experiment much more than before uh, disciplines and sectors that used to be addressed in silos. So, uh, well, a bigger deal is about urban governance and land management. And just to, to, to go uh, from, from theory to practice, I want to share a little bit uh, about my, my personal experience. Uh, actually, I, I've spent three years in Conakry, the capital city of Guinea, uh, which is a very linear city and very informal with a very limited density of, of urban streets. Uh, one of the, the least dense cities for, 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 for street infrastructure in, in West Africa. And actually the, the, well, the plan, the ambition was to um, uh, approach 
uh, transport planning through the urban planning lens by actually trying to create a, a polycentric system, a decentralized agglomeration uh, where transit oriented development around BRT station or train station could actually activate um, a public participation in informal neighborhoods and communities. Um, well, then deconcentrating government function, but also logistic uh, uh, and industrial function from, from the port, which is located in Kaloum at the very extremity of the peninsula to, to, to the other extremity was actually to, to just um, give more space for the city to breathe and, and combine functions together, uh, create intermodality, but also multifunctionality around those new hubs, which are already in urbanized areas. Um, well, the reality is that when we start to plan infrastructure uh, with uh, actually looking at the urban, uh, the urban framework and, and the system, we realize how much we have to deal with informality and see how we can connect this kind of infrastructure planning with communities that are, are living in, in, in this kind of, of, of context. So we faced four major obstacles uh, when it was about to really look at how to implement big visions into uh, uh, practical uh, pilot projects and short-term results for people. First, we, we realized the lack of urban planners not only in universities, but also at the local government, definitely at the national government, but also in the private sector. So that was actually a kind of void that made it difficult to get out of the silos. I mean, transportation, waste management, sanitation. Okay, we addressed all of those issues, but we, we had difficulties to, to find a consensus because uh, we were still in, in, in this, this way of seeing thing. And, and you can see, uh, well, we use digital tools, but we also used physical tools for uh, informed decision-making um, by having many uh, people, communities, decision-makers, stakeholders around the table, which has a, the table was actually a physical model. Uh, but then we faced the lack of data and actually collecting data and even planning tools are very quickly obsolete because the city is growing much faster than planning uh, is, uh, is happening. And um, well, the community engagement is still very uh, difficult to, to centralize per, per district, uh, not actually in a very immediate way. So it takes time to reach people and to organize them together. And then there is, of course, the issue of land tenure insecurity and no updated cadastre, but also at that, at that point in Conakry, uh, there was not yet uh, any digitalized cadastre. So uh, we try to understand how to uh, really transform this approach into something more adapted to the local culture, but we also see uh, people and human activity on the ground as the real potential to, to build incremental, smart and healthy communities from, from the smallest scale. Uh, yeah, so this is, these pictures are taken in the, the market of Medina in Conakry for, for, for those who, who know. And uh, well, the, the, the mass transit system is planned to have uh, more than two, 230,000 passengers per day per direction. Um, but the idea is, of course, to see how much, how, how to optimize uh, the amount of people that could be immediately beneficiaries of these uh, of, of this uh, mass transit line uh, by looking at how we can uh, readjust land through land value capture and uh, um, transit oriented development. So we calculated a little bit how many people live at 10 minutes walking from BRT, HRT station. Uh, but again, the lack of data is, is not easy to tackle. And that leads me to actually, uh, well, potentially the main message is that um, while a city can have urban planning tools or even a vision 
which is actually a strategic comprehensive urban plan, then it requires the right capacity with, with the right skills to address this vision and to implement it. Also uh, by taking care of citizen engagement. And I think once we have those two pillars, we still lack of the, the third pillar, which is about knowledge and data informed decision making. And that's where actually African cities have a huge potential. And I'm, I'm not specifically talking about local governments or planning departments, but I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about universities uh, and uh, potentially incubators uh, linking the academic sector and the private sector to actually take care of what urban data uh, or, or how urban data can be not only collected and analyzed, but treated to find uh, really community-based incremental solutions. And if we start to have a kind of smart urban labs uh, where universities, uh, local planning departments or local governments, also national government potentially, can build together an urban observatory where uh, data is actually treated in an open way, then we start to have this kind of tools that can nurture uh, a, a better vision for the city through a better consensus and actually build as well the capacity and the skills. And for all of this, we, we, we don't need just uh, uh, computer engineers, we, we, need, we need planners that has, have this ability to link or to connect the dots. So basically, uh, well, there are different ways to approach uh, smart urban labs. Uh, well, that's one term. We can also talk about urban observatories, which are a bit more centralized and, and, and formal and official. Um, but the idea is that, uh, or the purpose is, that it, is, is to be able to monitor and update uh, urban data on a regular basis and also urban planning tools. So, um, once we can start to digitize land management, once we can start to coordinate policies because we have data informed um, processes. Well, land security, um, the anticipation of land acquisition to build better suburbs, to connect them better, to combine infrastructure development, densification, and the uh, land value capture to make it happen. All of this becomes more uh, visible and comprehensible for all. So, um, well, that's potentially a tool, but I believe, and, and because we, we were uh, talking today a lot about the, 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 well, the evolution of, of planning and design education in Africa, I believe that there is a world to, to be taken by university in this. Um, then of course, the, there is the whole fact about, uh, well, the success factors, which are very much linked to governments. Governments itself can actually find more strength in this kind of tool, but the tool can also, um, also needs a, a, a more uh, transversal, uh, governance and a, and a better institutional landscape at the local level to happen. And uh, that's what, for example, secondary cities need. They usually, if you, if you look at uh, secondary cities like uh, Maradi in Niger or Kikwit in, in, in DRC or, um, I don't know, Nakuru in, in, in Kenya, we, we have this kind of uh, lack of capacity compared to the, the capital city because the, the country is still very centralized and there is a need to catch up quickly because there is not much time before the population double. And well, digitalization is, is this potential tool to, to quickly catch up with, with this capacity. So um, there are different ways to approach, of course, an urban observatory. Uh, the, the first way is the, the most democratic one is to, to to create an open data portal, like here you can see the one of Cape Town, uh, which gives all the information and connects it together through a GIS online portal. 
well, there are multiple models like uh, uh, what is also happening as a result of a research in the private sector in Ghana with the use of blockchain, where actually uh, land information, land data can be shared in a decentralized way for everyone. Um, well, there are different scenarios and there is not one model for all countries and all cities. But you can see that more and more around the world, cities are building their urban observatories, their smart city labs, and try to, 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 to integrate this information to improve decision making. And that's a huge opportunity for, for, for African cities. So, um, but definitely it's a huge opportunity to, to build a tool of research at universities and create a modelized tests um, what can this, the African city become tomorrow uh, by involving local people, even, I mean, we talk about people center, but uh, we, can, we can also, uh, and I'm talking about university, but we can also talk about primary and secondary cities. I mean, the Yolf is the future of African cities and the earliest they are involved, the better it is because uh, making the city is actually uh, something that everyone can share. I mean, there, there is a part of knowledge that requires specialists and there is a part of experience that can be shared by all, all kinds of groups of population. So, um, yeah, as I said, if those digital tools can become opportunities for better decision-making at the municipal level, the national level, well, it improves governance. If it can empower local communities and people, we can have very, um, let's say, yeah, incremental or tactical solutions for water management, water collection, waste collection, and um, uh, circular economy solutions using waste, uh, land use management in a community to, to, to find consensus maybe not for a megacity in one day, but maybe for a few communities with pilot projects, and then finally reach a bigger scale for uh, cities that are growing actually really uh, fast, sometimes really too fast. And this can lead to serious games as we call them, it's gamification through digitization that can involve people to play something and, and make digital placemaking happen and, and co-design actually uh, uh, their, their space, their collective space. So maybe I, I, I will finish with this question, like how informality participatory process and digitalization can be approached by African city makers. I say city makers really involve, involve a, a multiple range of stakeholders to develop people-centered and incremental solutions for inclusive and agile and urban environment. So that, that would be maybe my, my last sentence and my question for it with a picture here of Bukavu and, and uh, really impressive hills that uh, have been quickly urbanized uh, uh, these, these last years. So thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. Oh, it was not too long. <laughs> that was great, Sebastian. And that was a wonderful question to end on. I'm sure we can talk about that topic for quite some time. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you, Karen. Our last panelist for today was not able to join us live due to some last minute travel disruptions. However, she was kind enough to submit her recorded remarks ahead of time. So Imadali Okumwabwa is an urban planner, professor of African architecture and urban design with over 20 years built environment experience. Imadali studied architecture and urban planning at the University of Tennessee and Georgia State University. She holds a master's degree in African studies from Clark Atlanta University. And in 2013, she founded the Community Planning and Design Initiative Africa, or CPDI Africa, which is a research-based, culture-inspired initiative created to develop a new architectural language through design competition. So here are Amadali's remarks on culture and the making of cities on the African continent.
It might take us one second to get the video pulled up. Please uh, bear with us. Sorry, everyone, give us one more second while we activate the sound. I wanna first of all, um, Dave, thank you so much for the invitation, um, African Innovative Network. Um, we will be speaking today on architecture, city planning, and the evolution of these spaces from an Afrocentric perspective. I wanna first of all, of all um, just kind of pull up the premise that this webinar is built upon, and that is how could culture influence the making of the cities on the continent? Um, for the most part, most of us are very aware of Africa's contribution to civilization through her monumental architecture, um, city planning, um, all that was designed and built by master builders um, from African antiquity. Um, many of these traditions have, have um, had a challenge um, being translated in contemporary times due to the history of, of, of Africa's evolution, at least over these past four or 500 years. But the question is, as we move forward now with Africa emerging, um, almost like a, a final frontier, um, how can we talk about designing and building spaces on the continent that reflect our culture um, and that are sustainable? Again, building upon um, local science and technology that have been mastered through thousands of years um, by African inventors. So why an Afrocentric approach? Why is it important to reflect the architectural philosophies of Africa for the development of her cities, rural and urban landscapes? For that, we need to look at the definition of architecture itself. And I start with architecture because it is the building block of our communities, right, of our cities. Well, architecture is defined as the art and science of constructing a building, but further defined, it says it is the reflection of the culture, lifestyle, aesthetics, local building materials, climate, geography, political and economic purchasing power of a people and a place. And that means if so defined, every culture and every society will, be, will expand on its own identity. For Africa, that would be the same way, right? The definition of design is not that you abandon your architectural philosophies or design languages for those coming from other societies. It is not defined as you abandoning your own materials for other cultures or materials that are attached to their, uh, that are attached to status and meaning and, and, and spirituality from other societies. Architecture is not defined that you um, abandon your own development standardization, right, of your materials and your design languages, or you abandon sustainable practices for someone else's that you find it hard um, to afford or maintain, right? So as we move forward, whose philosophies are we trying to emulate? And what good is it doing us, especially in this case, as we're talking about city development, um, Africa-wide? Well, I build a lot of my uh, scholarship on the theoretical framework that was established by Professor uh, David Hughes, FAIA and NOMAC, um, out of Ohio State, Kent State um, University in Ohio. And he says, Afrocentric architecture is a distinctive manifestation of form, imagery, and space in the modern built environment, which derives from the cultural, environmental, and historical origins of the continent of Africa. And so when we apply this in the built environment, especially in city design, what do we come up with? 
right? Um, Dimas Wonko, Nigeria's premier Afrocentric designer, talks about a natural synthesis where you're building upon the science and technology that is indigenous to you, um, and then marrying it with borrowed um, design practices. So you create environments that are comfortable for you today, not being stuck in the past, not dropping who you are um, and copying some someone else's uh, design languages completely and not being able to fit in it. But what is that natural synthesis? What is that marriage between the two languages? Um, and then how do we use that to create new environments, um, cityscapes for ourselves today, um, architecture for ourselves today? So Africa is developing and not just the continent, but her diaspora as well. Um, so we're talking about the way forward. Who are these people that we're designing for? Um, who are they? Um, and so in 20 um, Afrocentric theory, um, by creating CPDI Africa, which again stands for the Community Planning and Design Initiative Africa. And it was my um, response to the challenge that he proposed in his scholarship. Um, CPDI is a culture-inspired, research-based, design-built initiative created to inspire the development of African-centered design languages for Africa and the, and the diaspora that are culturally and environmentally sustainable. So when you're looking at this, looking through this lens, um, you will see how it, it, it becomes easy to create spaces that are affordable, right? Um, that are harmonious, that are spiritually engaging to the people that are occupying them. And in addition, um, I came up with five different principles, you could say, um, that using these principles, any designer can, can take a space, um, whether it's ur urban or rural, um, whether it's architecture, in any location, using this Afrocentric lens and create spaces um, that work. Looking at, looking through a cultural lens and aesthetics, spiritual spirituality, local materials, and development philosophies, which I call today community engagement, right? And so let me take some time to look at a few of these so we see, see what all we mean when you're using um, this lens to begin solving some of the challenges that we're facing on the continent, especially when we're talking about urbanization, right? So um, if you don't understand the culture of African people, and it's thousands of ethnic groups, it's not just one culture, it's thousands of cultures. If you don't understand them well, then you're creating spaces that don't work well for the community, right? So what's what's culture? What's lifestyle and tradition? And all of those things translated into our built environment. Well, looking at um, the family compound, right? The house is the smallest unit of the built environment, right? It's a collection of these houses, right? On a grander and grander scale that give you your village, your town or your city, right? Or your nation, uh, your state or your nation, right? So how did Africans um, lay out their, their homes, right? Um, it was always a collection of rooms around exterior spaces, which we call courtyards, all right? A lot of life happened in the community, the communal um, arena, which was outside, right? Um, there wasn't a lot of architecture happening, a lot of building happening because people were actually enjoying the great weather. So you, you went into your rooms and these spaces that we see on these floor plans, these are rooms, these are rooms around courtyards or um, bedrooms around open living rooms that made up their houses. The family compound was a large space that integrated internal in interior and exterior spaces, right? Um, so when we look at this and then you expand this on a larger level, what does that look like with a village layout or a town or a city? How did they naturally interact between the indoors and the outdoors, right? So how would we play that on a larger scale? Especially now that we're talking about urbanization, right? Everyone's moving from the villages to the cities. The cities are not even able to contain the people. They're not planning that well for them. Um, people are coming, thinking that coming for better jobs, a better way of life, and they get to the city and they don't necessarily have the skills. They're leaving environments like what we see on the left, their family, their um, compounds, which are their bedrooms, you know, 
around the courtyards, right? Made out of, out of the natural materials, very organic, very affordable, right? Very well designed. And they're heading to the cities and they don't necessarily have the skills to fit in or the economics to afford what they find them. So how are we really planning for them, right? Um, the images that I have on the right are some examples where um, if you want to build in the city and you not, don't necessarily want to or are not allowed to build what we see on the left where you're coming from, what are a couple of steps above? What are some prototypes that we could come up with that might fit in the city? And some of these actually fit quite well. This is trying to resolve some of the challenges that we see today um, with answers that we have not just from the past, but from our villages that still operate today, all right? So instead of coming to the city, you don't have the skills, you don't have the financial resources to fit in, right? Um, and then you begin to build um, slums or shanty towns all around the periphery of the city that look like this. Well, how could designers work with city planners and the community, right, to build, um, compounds or neighborhoods that utilize the skills of the people themselves that are coming from those rural areas. These houses here, maybe not as pretty as they could be, but they're made out of the same material that we have in the traditional places, right? The um, clay brick, or it could have been rammed earth, right? These are very neat. Um, and the people could do these themselves. So how do planning officials speak with architects and the community to begin to work together to solve those challenges that we're facing because of the rapid urbanization? Just a quick example of culture and how that plays out in the city. How about aesthetics? Very important because what we see, right? So when we look at the, the areas where, you know, the slums, the shanty towns, it doesn't look good. How can we make it look better, right? We know Africa has incredible aesthetics. Well, let's talk about traditional once again. What do we see in those rural areas? Here are some, some images from Burkina Faso, Ghana, South Africa, Cameroon. Um, beautiful architecture, architecture, aesthetically pleasing. So how do we apply this when we move to the cities? No need to leave the aesthetics behind and those identifiers, those things that identify us, uh, identify us culturally, right? Those patterns, those motifs, whether they have meanings or not, um, those shapes and those forms, how do we borrow from, from the aesthetics of African culture as we move into uh, development, right? Or I love to show this one, the one by Pierre Atepa in Togo, the ECOWAS building. How do we draw on, you know, even aesthetic inspiration from artifacts, right? These are shanty stools or the different headrests. He takes that to inspire his ECOWAS building, right? Shapes and forms and patterns and aesthetics. Oh, how about what, what Akon is proposing um, for Akon City in Senegal? He's inspired by the crashing waves and other aesthetics of his community. What would those aesthetics look like, right? Um, this is community development on a grand scale. Who is this for? Is it for your average African, your elite? Is it for guests and tourists from out of, uh, off the continent? It's for everyone. This is an incredible um, um, example to talk about when we talk about um, development in, uh, on the continent or other aesthetics. I'd love to show this one. You can see the pattern and motif on a very large scale here. This is for a resort and cultural center done by one of our CPD Africa architects, Fawaz Adelaja out of Nigeria. So again, pulling on the aesthetics is a powerful move. What about spirituality? Something that was so important in the evolution of African space. Um, the fact that deities, you know, most people now are not um, practicing any form of African spirituality, we either we're Christians or we're Muslims, but the fact that African spirituality was quite sacred, people didn't even have to have doors in their, on their houses and in their neighborhoods, because people were very aware that the eyes of God were on you, so you didn't go into hurt or to maim or to, to, to steal, right, uh, people were very, very mindful of that everyone was their brother's keeper. How do we bring some of these practices back into design of our spaces, whether it's within our homes or in our cities? Uh, this is an example from Edward Soto, the Ifa house. Um, he's pulling on those um, de deities, the columns that held up um, the roofs in the Yoruba palaces, and he brings those into his internal spaces. 
how could these also play out in um, open space design, right? The eyes of God are on you. Spiritual practice is very important. What we see uh, where Francis Carey um, invites the ancestors to when the students are learning, right? Um, how do you design spaces that are spiritually charged based on the practices that are still part of the community that we're speaking of? Local materials, that conversation is very important. I'd like to show these images because um, it's people out, um, they're having, a, a, there's a festival that's going on. Like I said, so much happened outside just because the weather was great. So there was very little architecture going on. So when you're talking about open, open um, planning, public spaces, parks, where people congregate, they want, you might not need a lot of architecture but you can design exterior spaces that accommodate the things that people do in African cities. What does that outdoor space look like? Um, just showing these images to show how typically um, a, lot of, a lot happened outside. But again, back to the materials. Nobody beat Africa when it came to sustainable organic materials. Um, bamboo, clay, straw, wood, stone. These are some examples of this very same materials, but being used in new ways. Um, these are resort, resorts out in, in the East Africa. It's the same materials, uh, but done by architects. And these are conversations that we have talking about city planning and deforestation, how we're using our materials and how we are maintaining the climate, climate um, just everywhere. You talk about using materials that biodegrade easily, go right back into the earth. So you're not creating so much waste um, for waste management in your, management in your cities. Uh, this image, she's happily cooking and growing her building materials out of her window, love it. Or the use of clay, right? The stigma attached to traditional building materials um, needs to go away, right? And so we see now architects that are here, um, Roman Gorshkov using rammed earth, it's the same material as we see in these local images on the left, uh, Dimas Wonko was a master of that, is a master of using the correct materials for the continent. And then the last was um, community engagement, right? Typically in our cities, um, people came together to build. There was no uh, talk of affordable housing or people being homeless because the people came together to build members of their society, their homes, people work together. How do we bring this back into um, the conversation? We're talking about developing African cities. Here, women would often do the, uh, the design and decor after buildings are done, but it's sweat equity and they use materials that were available on site. So we're talking about really low cost, right? No cost almost or maintaining your buildings, right? The cost of maintenance. If people can come together like they used to, and then we can see here it still do, um, we're talking about maintaining our cities um, very easily. This was mastered by Habitat for Humanity. As some of you know his story, he's in the Congo on a missionary trip and he sees some Congolese building a, a new home for a family and he comes back to America to create Habitat. And what is Habitat? is built off of an African design philosophy, community members coming together to help build, not just for the needy, but for everybody, right? Francis Carey has mastered this technology and this approach or this design philosophy of the community engaging and working together. And so has Miriam Kamara in her home country of Niger. And so what we do at CPDI, we teach, we teach these design philosophies in many ways through competitions, which we actually have one going on now, and then through the launch of our global studio for African-centered architecture, now we provide online courses for practitioners and students to learn um, these ide ideologies. And they're based on the theoretical frameworks by Professor David Hughes and architect uh, Dimas Wonko. Um, we off we um, offer certificates in African-centered architecture and people can take courses in just about everything that has to do with the built environment, architecture, cultural studies, um, heritage preservation, urban planning, spirituality, sustainable materials, and so much more. And so we have a lot for everyone to enjoy um, and to benefit from our courses. Students 
get content, those who need to teach how to build and develop and develop um, African community cities can take our courses, professionals um, get great content out of our work, um, and also policymakers. How can we really move forward in guaranteeing that we can build Africa um, in a better way, in her image, sustainably, um, and comfortably for everyone involved. So thank you for this opportunity to present uh, on the African Cities webinar. Um, we look forward to seeing much more of you. Once again, this is Madli Okamabwa with CPD Africa. Do engage with us at cpdafrica.org and let's enjoy the rest of the conference. Fantastic. I want to thank all of our panelists again today. Um, and to those of you who have been putting your questions into the q and day into the chat. Thank you so much for your engagement. As I mentioned, Madeli was not able to join us live today, but if you do have questions for her, we still do encourage you to share them with us and we can pose them to the group or we can follow up with answers separately. I also want to remind folks to please keep entering your questions into the Q&A and we will do our best to answer them all. I understand we are running a little over on time, but if you can stick around for maybe 20 to 30 more minutes, we'd love to stay on because we really want to get all of your questions answered. So to kick off our q and I would like to open it to all of the panelists, but for our first question, Dr. Olani, maybe I'll start with you first, um, if you don't mind, but it would be great to get everyone's thoughts. On the topic of educational models, one thing that stood out to me during our introductions is the global breadth of academic institutions represented in our backgrounds from the US to the UK to Uganda, Kenya, South Africa. And in the chat, there was a comment quoting Oliver from 2007 that mentions because some developing countries don't have universities, they may struggle to identify their problems or they may give up or never really engage with those issues. How important uh, do you feel it is for future urban planners and architects in Africa, especially in developing countries to be educated locally? And then what are some of the benefits and some of the drawbacks of acquiring that knowledge or that training elsewhere? That is a very good question. And thanks very much for that question coming up. Um, there, there is a historic precedent for that. So we actually don't have to go very far to answer that one. Um, when architectural education itself um, was just starting in the context of West Africa, uh, actually, before it started, a number of students were sent off to the United Kingdom to study. And what they found in their education, I think it was the University of Manchester at, the point, at that time, uh, they were being taught about snow loads and um, winter winds from the north. And they quickly realized that there was no such thing in Nigeria. Well, they, they probably knew that before. And they queried this and asked, why on earth are we being taught stuff that we're never actually going to use? Um, so they had a big conversation that ended up at a conference called the Tropical Conference on Tropical Architecture in 1956, I think it was, no, 53, I think. And eventually that is what led to a lot of the curricula of architecture education across the tropics. Um, so what was implemented was a direct result of that. So the, those students um, knew at that early age stage that local knowledge is very important. And unless they're helped to incorporate it within their design thinking, the chance of them doing it professionally will not be there. And so it, it is extremely important that students engage with it. So even though you're doing your projects, your, your studies overseas, you do have to engage with your local conditions at some point during your career and bring it into your projects. And this is one of the things that we are attempting to do at the University of Lincoln, where I am, is we, we do have a lot of international students. And one of the things we're attempting to do is try and ensure that they engage with it before they finish their third year, which is the, what they call the part one, uh, which means that you engage with most times during your dissertation. In my own career, I also find this very important. And this is one of the things that I, I probably didn't mention, but I should have, the importance of electives. Where electives mean you have to engage with something that is meaningful to you and it comes back into whatever you're going to be designing or working with as part of the professional uh, educational approach. I faced that in my own education because I had my education in Australia and Canada. 
And if I didn't have that option to do electives, I would not have been able to diversify and go and deal with the things I'm dealing with. Uh, and my elective took me to Malaysia, Indonesia, and eventually when I did my master's to Uganda. So, so it's a route that you all students probably should be aware of if you're ever going to study overseas. Uh, do not neglect that link because it's an important way of you grounding yourself when you eventually go back to wherever you came from. Um, yes, thanks for that. Thank you for that answer. Sebastian or Dr. Mayino, would you like to add anything? Um, perhaps I could go next, but I agree with um, Dr. Olweni on that, that so the benefit of being able to study locally when you're embedded within a certain city, if you're a planning student, for example, is hopefully that part of the curriculum would allow you to, or part of the courses would allow you to actually get out of the classroom and go into these cities and go into these neighborhoods and come back to class and envision how you can um, improve design or what did you go and find out? And that's what, what the, I mean, that was a training I went through, for example, in the University of Nairobi in Kenya where the planning degree was structured in such a way that every year had a specific component that you had to go out into the city. So if you're a first year planner, then you're working at a, at a small site. If you're a second year, then maybe you're looking at a city or a town. If you're a third year, then maybe you're looking at a sort of a, a county or a region. And by the time you're getting to fourth year, you're very well versed with the small and the large scale dynamics of, of the cities that you live in. And hopefully, if we come back to the first presentation, if the curriculum is designed in such a way that students are not being um, sort of informed with too much of information around like a, a sort of Western model of changing our cities, but actually being like, okay, now that we've gone into this neighborhood, if it's Kibera or Bukuru Kwanjenga slums, um, or now that we've gone into Nyeri County, what did you learn? What did you find out on the ground? What are people doing? How, how are the economies working? And so if you're a town planner trying to design an improved, if you have a project with your classmates about something you want to change in the city, then I think the missing component that I would like to push on is let's not try and impose different or Western ideas on what we saw in the field, but let's begin to innovate solutions that are more grounded because the field work was supposed to bring us closer to what the city is, what the realities are. And all of us live in the city already. So if we come into a lab that is so closed from what we know is the truth, then we have this sort of dichotomy between we're trying to teach students to build imaginary cities that are not the reality of, of what is out there. But I believe the, the, the key component of studying locally is to be able to interface with, with the city that you're in and hopefully turn that into um, action or policy or programs and designs. Really good points. Thank you for sharing those. While I have you, Dr. Mayina, we did have a comment in the chat um, from Daniel, who mentions that three issues driving planning today are sustainability or localization, the circular economy and ecology. And um, you have mentioned platform economies, which Daniel respectfully questions as a solution to African urban issues. We're just wondering if um, you feel that there should be a separation of what is overtly technical and the planning variables where participatory frames can be applied. Um, Daniel points out that every society needs water, electricity, et cetera, but things like transport, housing, even electricity can be provided differently based on cultural norms. Curious to get your thoughts there. That's true. It's true. I agree with that. that um... Um, when it comes to some, some of the problem solving, I think when I was pointing more towards the, the, the exciting developments that are happening in technology and innovation, it's not so much to drive um, that sort of Western way of understanding what, what is data, or what can we do with AI or robotics, but to say some of the changes are allowing a different way of interacting across departments or across um, um, public, private sector, or how we can leverage on technology or computing or analytics to be able to understand the city better. And so I, I do agree that to be able to meet the sustainability goals of what we would like to drive as a future form of urbanism, we don't necessarily even need to rely on like technology as a tool, but we need to understand that we can't operate in the sort of silo model that we are used to. And if we can leverage on what the technology is allowing us to do, so why don't we do that? And a good example I was thinking about is, if for example, as a planner, you want to track how much the, uh, the, the city has grown or where you want to invest the next parks or schools or BRT as we saw in the third presentation, 
you could look at your development applications and see how many people are applying to build. So how can we project urban growth based on development applications? But if most of the development is happening in a um, informal way, so people are not applying to the city, then we don't have a clear way of measuring growth. But if you come and look at what technology and spatial GIS analytics or, or big data is allowing us to do, or remote sensing, for example, you can map and project urban growth in a way that you would not be able to see if you're just looking at development applications. So maybe my provocation is to not just, um, not look at te technology as a silver bullet, but to figure out how can we um, leverage technology to solve the problems we have today. And if, there's, um, if we can pull from the skills of um, different practitioners who are not necessarily planners. So if some level of high-end remote sensing requires you to have computer engineers in your team, it requires you to have a data analyst as we're hearing from, um, from Sebastian, we, we would need to bring the team together. Yes, the technocrats. But as well, we need to drive a different way of dealing with the community that we're trying to solve problems for. So there's different ways to planning processes embedding more of community participation, but at the same time, a broader way of thinking around what are we solving for and how can we get there faster and more effectively. I hope that sort of pushes towards an answer, but I really like the question from Daniel. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your answer. And thank you for the question, Daniel. Um, the next question in the q and is Sebastian, I will start with you first, um, but we'd love to get the thoughts from all of our panelists is um, what, according to you all, are the different approaches and methodologies for measuring the effectiveness of land use planning tools towards achieving Sustainable Development Goal 11? So that's the Sustainable Cities and Communities Goal um, in African towns and cities. So Sebastian, maybe I can start with you to get your thoughts on that one. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Corinne. Thank you for the, the very deep question. Actually, uh, well, land use management, we know it's a, it's a difficult, but it's also a fantastic issue. Um, it has brought a lot of issues in African cities, but it has also um, shaped African city without this kind of standardization uh, that appears in the westernized way almost everywhere in the world. Um, so sometimes it depends how we see it, but um, uh, well, land is, is a resource uh, that require a kind of uh, information sharing. And uh, at the moment we feel like we enter an unknown territory when we try to see how to manage land in a, in a quickly growing city. Well, I still believe that there is a kind of compromise between a, a form of centralized management of land for a city and uh, a kind of community model of consensus at a very local level to decide how to uh, uh, perhaps uh, pool land together, to rebuild, to reorganize the land um, by doing it uh, by the community. Uh, so, so the, the first approach that you would see in, in countries in Europe or Asia is to centralize everything and to say, okay, let's, uh, let, let's centralize land management and say, okay, this is the typology of housing for everyone. Uh, now you can see in African cities, you, you have actually communities and people are building the city much more than local governments or developers are doing it. And uh, this is already happening. And uh, maybe from this starting point, it would be interesting to see uh, how actually we can find a balance between the land readjustment uh, because of, uh, for example, uh, connectivity, connectivity, connectivity issues, sorry, at the, at the city scale and the needs uh, or the capacity of the local community to organize the neighborhood by itself and and, and maybe, you know, it's like an urban village, like uh, try to have a, com a committee that uh, decide how to reinvest uh, local taxes products into uh, street uh, rehabilitation, upgrading of the plots and so on. Um, I don't really believe that uh, we would have uh, 
the same model working as we can see in London or Tokyo or Berlin. I really think that African cities need to find their model, which is much more tactical and incremental. So yeah, it's, it's my opinion, but yeah, of course it's a, it's a big topic and we, we didn't prove anything yet uh, in this. Thank you for tackling that very big uh, challenging question for us first. That was a great response. Dr. Owaini, would you like to add anything? I have to congratulate Sebastian and actually being able to cover a lot of ground on that particular question because uh, there's a lot embedded in it. And uh, to me, I think I, I have to also suggest that what Sebastian said is very true that we cannot continue to try and solve African urban challenges using Western approaches or Eastern approaches for that matter because they are quite unique for the context of Africa. Uh, and a lot of times the challenges are being addressed through a very capitalist approach. I think there was a, there was a comment in the chat about that at some point. Um, we, there is no denying that urban areas are an, are an important part of sustainability because it means that you're addressing the distribution of urban services in a very efficient way. But that means it's important to address the reality that cities are to operate for everybody and not for the minority. And currently the cities are in terms of land use management and land use allocation is for the minority and the minority being a carrier over from in many cases and, and in this case I can talk specifically about East Africa were designed for a minority, i.e. the colonialists. And the planning that exists on the ground in many of these cities has carried on 60 years later doing exactly the same thing. And so you have a very large marginalized population who feel that uh, they are not part of that aspirational future. Uh, so th there's a key part in making uh, these decisions more equitable by addressing the fact that the majority of people there are marginalized and unless they are brought into the fold the tensions and conflicts that will exist will continue to exist because a lot of people feel that they're not part of that paradigm and so the sdg 11 for it to work uh, needs a sort of a management or planning approach that addresses that very overt problem that exists in most African towns. Um, in most cases, when we look across Africa, the only place where this is very overt and where people look and say what's going on in South Africa, because it is very obvious about the separation in South Africa, but exactly the same thing exists in many other cities. And until that is brought to the forefront of discussions of thinking of policy, we're going to continue raising that question that has been raised just now. Um, thanks for that. Thank you. Dr. Mayena, anything that you would add? Um, not at the moment, I think it's been covered well. Thank you. Yeah, wonderful, thank you. At this point, we would like to open up the floor to any participants who would like to ask, ask their question directly. I did see that we did have a hand raised from Melissa. Melissa, if you would still like to ask your question, we're offering you this opportunity. Um, while we tee that up, if anyone else would like their question, would like to ask their question to the panelists directly, please just feel free to raise your hand in the chat and we can unmute your microphone and allow you to ask that. So we will see if we get any in. Corinne, mean, the, the, there are two questions in the chat. I think they're both directed at me, actually. Uh, OK. Would you like to take the one on um, architecture students working with current technological advancement? I was trying to avoid that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I do see we have Tiffany. Tiffany has raised her hand. Tiffany, would you like to ask your question? Yeah. I, I will answer Nessai's question after Tiffany. Wonderful. Tiffany, I believe you are unmuted. 
Okay, wonderful. Um, sorry, I'm using my wife's link. So this is actually Tariq Abdullah <clears throat> and not Tiffany. Um, quite so often, uh, she's more organized than I am with these uh, calendar events. Um, so I appreciate her and appreciate you all uh, for one, putting this, um, this conference together. Um, <clears throat> and thank you for uh, sharing the link, uh, Madeli Okomabwe which is a good friend of mine. Um, I put in the chat here, let me pull it up. Um, and Dr. Uh, Dr. Mark, this is um, again, Tariq Abdullah. I'm the principal architect at Tarkitex here in Atlanta and a few other states here in the States, United States. And we're quickly um, branching off into the African diaspora, particularly West Africa. But my question is in relation to the um, philanthropic efforts that I, I find myself um, consistently um, putting more time into. And the way I do that is through education. And um, in reference to this question in particular, um, it's in reference to how I try to give back, at least to try, through taking the time from my um, career to actually teach um, design studio in higher ed. So I do that uh, here in the States, but my question is in reference to how receptive is um, African universities and schools of architecture um, with respect to African-Americans teaching there. Um, and I say that because here in America, there's a um, there's about 130,000 some odd thousand licensed um, architects in America, um, and just two percent of that are black. So um, naturally, it's not a common thing to have a black professor um, that's licensed, that's practicing, that's a firm owner as your professor of design studio. So it's kind of like a um, unless you're at an HBCU, um, historically black college and university, uh, which I don't teach at, unfortunately, um, just don't have the opportunity to do that um, at this present time. But um, unless you're in an HBCU, it's you're you're a unicorn with a with overalls, right? So having said that, there's um, a number of undue um, complexities. Uh, just being who you are teaching, right? Whether that's coming from the uh, institution or just the students, um, which may or may not be, you know, within a particular demographic, but the the overall concept and idea and fact that you're such a minority and some, um, I, I would say, may not expect, you know, that you bring what you bring. Well, having said that, hopefully that doesn't exist abroad in the in the African diaspora, <laughs> um, at least not in the ways that I'm experiencing it here as an African American architect. Um, so I'm very interested to know uh, your perspective on that, uh, and that is the receptiveness of um, African universities to African Americans who are really just looking to, you know, be themselves. That is a great question, Tarek, and thank you very much for raising it. I could be sneaky and actually point you to students who are actually on attendance right now to answer it, but I won't do that. Um, I, I'll, I'll put it this way. Um, in part, what you've suggested is very true, that there are there, there is an us and them situation in many places. I did my research in East Africa. And I did go to, at that time, every single architecture school that was open in East Africa. And at that time, there were only 11 of them. Uh, actually, were they 11? No, there were less than that. There were, there were six of them, so there's not very many. Now they're, now they're 11. And one thing you found there is they currently right now, all of them, um, probably, a, except from two, and I will not name them, 
were very, very open to having an international faculty because international faculty comes with a lot of benefits with for the university itself. The university I was at in particular uh, had gone out of its way to ensure that it had international faculty. And at the time I was there, we had um, one person from Australia, one from Malaysia. Uh, I have no idea where I was from, but I, I was a the, the my colleague called the International Man of Mystery because I came from everyone everywhere. And for the students, I think that enriched their experience. Now, having students um, having an experience of an African American would enrich them even more. And we've had, um, and this is one of the opportunities that COVID brought for us the ability to link with students uh, and faculty around the, the, the uh, world. And one thing that has happened as a result of that is I think we linked up with um, universe, uh, Washington University, I think was what Uganda Matas was linked to at the time. And they've done a number of students with that. Uh, and I think University of Washington or Washington University did bring some students over to Uganda at one point as well. And that was a very enriching experience for students on both sides. Um, obviously students going the other way has been a little bit more tricky, um, but we have managed to take some students to Australia as well. So the opportunities are there. Uh, the, the issue with the Uganda Masters University is that it was a private school, but not private in the same sense as it is in the United States. Um, it just means students pay their way. Uh, it does have implications in other areas, um, which we can discuss later. But because you have these private schools, they're more open to diverse inputs um, with university or public institutions tend not to have that ability just because of the way the structure of the organization is run and it's coming from public funds. But the fact that you do have a lot of pub private schools means that they're open to lots of different things. And I think there's a few schools in the south of um, the Democratic Republic of Congo, which are again doing the same thing. I think one, one of them is run by an African American as well of, of Congolese descent. So there are opportunities, and I think that input would be would really enrich students' perspectives. Although, for the most part, the faculty are black, I suspect one thing that is delinks that is what was being presented um, just before uh, about the um, the cultural context and the, the different lenses that exist and bringing in people different um, positions, different lenses will enrich that position. And um, in general, and one, one of the reasons I was always happy to teach in the context of Africa is that students are very open to having people from different places. So it, it's something that um, staff and faculty faculty, faculty and students could benefit from in that, that regard. Um, and th the reason I said students, because I know Nase Edwards was actually one of my students. <laughs> so, uh, so I can actually answer her question as well, and then I'll, I'll pass it back to Tariq here. Uh, in terms of um, current technologies, I think the overemphasis on technology sometimes detracts from the key issues of architecture and planning, which has to do with the people factor. And I think the te technology has, has been presented in, in a number of the, the papers today, I think Sebastian's particularly, um, uh, and I think Miriam in terms of big data, is if we in, assume that the technology is going to help solve our problems, we miss the reality that we need to manage the technology for it to work. Uh, and it's something when I started my first job in Canada, my boss stated that we design the computer systems and the databases. They cannot manage us because we are the ones who put in the information. So therefore we naturally know how it works. And if it doesn't work for us, then there is a problem. And so that's always in the back of my mind. And I look at technology as an aid to what we're doing rather than a decision maker on its own. And so the technologies we use, we need to help enhance or make our jobs more efficient 
rather than a way of um, just doing things for the sake of doing technologies. And yeah, and, and CAD is one of those that always comes up in architecture school. Students want to learn CAD and they think CAD will solve the problem. Um, auto, Archicad's auto roof is a classic example of that. You're supposed to design the entire building, including your roof. The auto roof just complicates it and makes it difficult for the builder because you haven't really thought about it. So, so the technology is just a part of it. It's, it's not the end, it is just an aid to what designers do. Thank you, I hope that answers your question, Nassai, by the way. And Tariq, I hope I've answered your question too. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Alwini. I do know that we have a couple of questions still in the queue. Um, sadly, we are you know, running over time, so I'm going to pose one last um, opportunity for our panelists to share their final thoughts, final remarks before, before hand, handing it over to our founder, Leandri, to share his closing remarks. And if we haven't answered your questions, we will definitely make sure to collect those from you and follow up with responses. But in the interest of time, I want to make sure everyone can um, enjoy their weekend. So I'm going to start wrapping it up. Um, Dr. Mayina, why don't I open it to you and see if you have any final thoughts or um, any closing comments that you would like to leave us with today? Thank you very much, Corianne. Um... No, I think I think I really I, would, I really appreciate where Dr. Marco Lueni has ended that uh, all this innovation and ideas and technology and solutions that are coming are supposed to help us get to us um, to solve problems. So at the end of the day, what we need to do is figure out how best to solve problems that are local, that are urgent, and to drive our cities to a more sustainable future. Um, and how do we get there? Um, um, really incentivizing partnerships and collaboration and knowledge sharing and learning. And I really value this network of um, uh, African Innovation Network because it's beginning to open up these conversations and exchange of ideas across different cities, across different communities. And I really, it's an honor to have been here. So thank you so much for, for the invite and it was lovely to have this discussion. An honor to have you. Thank you so much for being a part. Um, Sebastian, how about you? Sorry, I'm here. No, really, I, I think, uh, well, I'm amazed by the initiative and also the level of exchange. Uh, um, I believe that the way African city makers or urban planners can make an African city model emerge, because this is something that is really lacking now. We, we, we have this over plans uh, model of city development coming from uh, Europe, America, Asia, and 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 there is there is something unique in African cities that that is just waiting to 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 flourish. Some something much more based on the the community, the people, and and we can learn a lot from this. But I would say uh, if African students can travel across African cities, just go on the ground. And also even since everything is so urgent also with uh, demographic growth, if universities can be uh, quickly involved in what is happening now on the ground, not wait to have a, a degree to start working on it, really that, that's really important. Um, so yeah, I'm... Uh, I'm very happy for of this invitation. I hope uh, uh, I can assist for uh, at more di dialogues. And uh, yeah, thank you everyone for the inspiration. Thank you so much, Sebastian. And we hope to have you back on sometime very soon. Dr. Oweni, I will leave it to you for any final thoughts or closing remarks. Thank you very much, Karine Rice. Thank you, Sebastian. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you to the AIN. Um, uh, when I was contacted about this some time ago, I, I thought I said yes, and then time went by and I realized I was suddenly upon us. Uh, but it's always a pleasure to talk about African urbanism and African architecture because it's been a part of my life for a long time. And it's always a pleasure to interact with people who are passionate about that as well. So in terms of 
this particular webinar on my interest in architecture and planning education. I'm always interested in what the next generation is going to do with all this knowledge that's coming their way and what they're going to make of the built environments in, in the future. And while we watched what Black Panther did about urbanism and how they represent it, what does that mean for us? Can we actually rethink that and go beyond the typical typologies that have driven architecture through largely European modernism rather than African modernism, which is still yet to emerge out of um, whatever uh, Africa has been through. And I, I think these discussions are a key part of that. And, and I really thank the Africa Innovation Network for this opportunity. And I hope to engage with everyone on this going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I want to thank, take the time to express my sincerest gratitude again to all of the panelists for their time today and extra time today um, and for this excellent discussion and session. We hope to repeat this again in the future. It has also been wonderful to get questions from you all from the audience. So thank you for being such an engaged group. If we didn't get to answer your question, please, please reach out to us. Um, we, our contact information is in the chat and we will do our best to respond to that as soon as we can. So this has been so much fun and it has been an honor to to take part. I will now hand it over to Leandri, the founder of Africa Innovation Network for his closing remarks. Thanks, Cori. Thanks, uh, everyone. I hope you're seeing my face. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thanks, Sebastian, Miriam, In, Cori, Yoel, Mark, everyone for this uh, amazing uh, event. Uh, first of all, I want to apologize because I know the date and the day, the day and the time we decide to plan this event is it's a bit challenging, but uh, next time we we'll see how to fix it. So uh, just to mention that uh, this webinar is part uh, of the launch of the, uh, of the second edition of our magazine about uh, African cities. And in this magazine, you, you will find all the topics that we have discussed uh, during this uh, webinar. It was a really pleasure and it was very insightful Thanks to all the panelists for the great presentations and all the knowledge that they, they have shared. It was uh, very amazing. And I want also to thank um, all the participants uh, with their comments, their questions, and for their interest to, to, to Africa Innovation Network and what we are doing. Just uh, stay tuned. Next week, uh, we, will, we will release the, the magazine. And we have also many initiatives that are uh, that we are planning and that, uh, yeah, we will be really soon. So thanks again. It was a really pleasure. And uh, yeah, thank you. And just uh, stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cheers. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Yeah.